the worship we just had, and, and if you don't know, uh, we should be excited because we have a, an opportunity this Friday, we're going to have what's called worship night, and uh, yeah, so if you're new around here, it's this Friday right here, 7 o'clock, the doors will be open at 6.30, and we're just going to come together and worship God, um, extended period of worship, it'll really be awesome and special, I hope that you'll all come, I hope you'll look for opportunities to bring somebody with you, I think it'll make a difference in all of our hearts and all our journey as we approach Easter. So I'm really excited. Even now, I've had a different morning, and I found myself, wow, this is awesome, just worshiping God, just sitting here worshiping God. It changes you. So very excited about Friday. I'll write that down. And, and as we approach Easter, what an opportunity um, to invite people to church and to share God's love. And just remember that. There's folks that they, they, they want to go out. That's important to them, and we need to seize every opportunity to do the, the most important thing we can do is share God's love um, with the world. So um, thanks for being here, and we're going to jump right in. I have a whole lot uh, to cover. Um, so um, one of the things I want to do with the rest of my life is, is continue to try to teach everyone the difference in a believer in Jesus and a follower. And as we grow, we understand um, that it's not enough to just believe. It's true that even the devil believed in Jesus that we are called to be real followers of Christ, and we want to teach you how to do this. And, and we will teach you how. It will require some work, but, man, when you do this, you become fully alive, and you're never the same. So we're in this series that you have been promoted and talking about some big ideas with that. I, I heard this line this week. I, I listened to many different um, podcasts and sermons throughout the week. They helped me grow. And I heard this line, and it just popped to me. I'm like, Wow. It's simple language, but I'd never quite thought about it this way. Here's the idea uh, that, that this was what was said. God depends on you. What do you think about that? God depends on you. And it's true. This is what we believe. God wants to share his love with everyone. And what's his means of doing that? You and I. God depends on us to share his love. And we have been promoted that that's what he, he wants to do. And somehow when we do that, we become more fully alive. It's a really awesome thing. And I hope that God will speak to you in powerful ways this morning. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and let's pray. Uh, God, we pray for your total anointing right now. And I pray you would speak to each and every one of us. Help us understand the difference in believer and follower and challenge us to where do we need to grow to be real followers of you. And, and the way we see it as we study your word, God. And help us to understand what it means to live our life, to understand you depend on us. You have things you want us to do in this journey of life. Lay that on our hearts. And then, God, may we not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, but do what it says. We want to be the real deal. And through your spirit, we can. And that's awesome. So thank you that we're here. And we're hungry. We're hungry to hear from you. Uh, so speak, God. We, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's all agree and say amen. All righty. So, uh, continuing in this idea, this series that you have been promoted, I love that. It's so true. That's what God does. He wants to promote you. He wants to promote you. I want to begin uh, uh, and share with you uh, some confessions, all right? Confessions of a human pastor, and, and you see if you can relate. But as, as I get honest with myself, um, I can get into all kinds of stuff, right? I can get into some weird stuff. I can be obsessive and compulsive about weird stuff and just get into weird stuff. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a period uh, in my life, but the period lasted a couple years. It's a long period of your life uh, where uh, it's a little surprising to me, but I found myself totally into the TV show The Walking Dead. All right. Do we have any other fellow sinners here who, and I'm joking about that. I, I don't. But, um, you know, I found myself totally getting into this. But just about every one of them shows as I'm watching it, there's this part inside of me in my gut like, should I really be watching this? And we all wrestle with junk like that, right? I mean, in today's world, every show on TV uses it. But should I really be watching this? Yeah, but I, I know I can get into anything. Here's a new one. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, it's weird to me as I confess this. There, there's a new show on Netflix, and because it was so – Highly rated. I thought I would check it out, and doggone it, I binge watched this sucker. And it, it's weird. It's called Cheer. 
Did any of you see the TV show? Raise your hand. Oh, oh, great. It's all little girls and me, Pastor Mike. That's what I was afraid of. I'm so glad. That I'm like, I'm going to look like a creeper. And, and, but I was, it was really awesome. But I'm like, should I be watching this? But it really, what you know about the lives and stuff, I was, I was, it, was like, it was like second chance you if you, I, I need to get on the message. But it was really awesome. Um, I can get into anything. I mean, that's a weird example. So a couple years ago, I come home. We live sort of out in the country. And um, I come home, and, and it, was, it was one of them days. It was hot, and it was wet. And I looked at my driveway, and my driveway was covered with worms. You know how there's certain days where everything just gets covered? Well, those of you that know, know I like to fish. And I don't know if you know, but something's happened, and the price of worms has skyrocketed in the United States of America. But it seems like when I was a kid, worms were like a buck, 50, a buck and a quarter. They're up to like three eighty nine a dozen. So I got out that night and tried to just catch me some. And it can get a little competitive. It, it can get fun. And so I kind of got into that. And then I came in after I caught some, and then I started doing a little research. And then the next night, I'm out catching more worms. And then I'm thinking about buying certain lights to do this. And I'm thinking about starting my own worm farm and becoming independently wealthy doing this. I can get into anything. So when, I'm, when I was doing this, I have my worm catching clothes, which aren't much, right? So it's like my pair of sweatpants with a hole in it because – Who's going to be around if I'm out catching worms, you know what I mean? And so I'm looking pretty trashy and pretty ridiculous. I'll own that, all right? So I'm out catching worms, and sure enough, a car pulls in our driveway when I'm out here catching worms. And sure enough, they went to our church, and sure enough, they're like the Ken and Barbie couple who dress real professional, and they got it all going on. And my daughter was babysitting, so they were dropping my daughter off, and here I am just busted probably couldn't look more ridiculous for a pastor, right? And there, and so dude's like, Mr. Cool Dude, and he rolls down the window, and he's like, what you doing? <laughs> I'm like, shh, you must be very quiet. I'm catching, I'm catching worms, man. And luckily, they still go here, all right? So I can get into anything, and, I, and we all can, and I think God knows this. So we have to be careful. This is why we need to keep him number one. And frankly, it's because it was so easy to get in anything. This is kind of how we wander away from God. It happens all the time. And we don't keep him first, right? So the Bible, I think, kind of warns us about this. Here's a verse in Ecclesiastes. Now, now this is written by a King Solomon, who most people believe uh, is the richest and wisest man who ever lived. Richest and wisest man who ever lived. And here's what he said. I have seen all things that are done under the sun, and all of them are meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. If you study his life, he's like, I've tried to fill this hole inside of me with stuff, but all the money in the world and all the women in the world and all the what, all of it, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. And be careful you don't miss the real purpose of life. And, and so this is what we're going to talk about today, how to know that we're living this. So I want to turn the corner. We're going to study from 1 Peter today. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to several verses just to share because I think it's good stuff. But then we're going to go to what I think is for sure a top 10 verse that I hope all of you will remember, memorize, put in your Bible. For me, this has just been a staple to my journey with God. I hope it will be to you. And I think it's so important. And I think God wants it to be important to us. But, but as we study 1 Peter, let me give you a little context because this is interesting. Um, 1 Peter was written to offer encouragement the suffering Christians, and we always need to go to the time. Who was this written to? When was this written? What was going on? And what was going on, the people that this was written to, um, the Christians were being tortured and killed for their faith, and the church was being persecuted. So you think we have it rough here? Not at all compared to this. There are people that just doing what we're doing now were being killed for this. And Peter writes this to encourage them, and, and let's study as we build to the to the big verses uh, that I want to teach on. But this, finally, all of you, he's reminding these people following the risen Savior, finally, all of you, be like-minded. We need to remember that. 
There's, there needs to be no divisions in the church. We are all on Team Jesus, trying to do something great uh, with our lives. and do, We don't need no divisions here. We should be together as one with the mission. And the mission is to live for God and, and glorify him. It says, be sympathetic, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, be humble. We all need to stay humble. It's not really about us, God reveals to us. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. This is a new way of life for many of us. Many of us are like, well, you hit me, I'll hit you harder. You steal from me, I'll steal more from you. You know, don't, you mess with the wrong guy. No, there's a new way of living. And it says we're called to that. In fact, that's what it says. You are called so that you may inherit a blessing. We're all called by God. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Right there is something, that's enough. That's enough for the morning right there. Uh, if you want to love life and have good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. And so it's talking about this new life that we strive to have and live and grow. And then it, it fast forward here to verse 15. It says, but in your hearts, here's how we're called to live as followers, not believers, followers. Set apart, it says revere, but other versions say set apart. Christ is Lord. It changes everything when, when, when Christ is Lord of your life. And then it says, here's what we're to do. Always, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be ready. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope you have in this new life. And then it says, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you uh, and your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed. So you're supposed to live in such a way that even if people didn't like you or didn't like the old you or whatever, they're like, they can't deny, but you know what, no matter what, that's the real deal. That's a good person right there. That's, that's all I can say about that person. And we're supposed to all live our lives that way. So um, here's, here's the first point, and here's, it's like four steps. I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to start in the beginning. Four steps, step one, step two, to, to, to following God that we must understand. All right, so the first step is this. Uh, this point number one, God loves you. That's the first. You can't go any farther until you understand that. And it probably took me hanging around church for a year to really understand God loved me. Because of all the sin, I thought God was mad at me. There was no way God could love me. And that is a lie from hell. God loves you. If you don't know that, God loves you. That'll change your life. Step two is not only does God love you, God chose you. Right there is, whoa, whoa, God chose you. Third thing is, and God will reveal this to you as you grow. God's spirit is inside of you. Hey, part of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is living inside of you if you're a follower of Christ. And then point number four is this. This is the new life. This is a follower. You are called to do something great for Jesus. You're called to do something great for Jesus. So ideas throughout the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his son. God gave his son. If it had been just you, he would have done that for you. God loves you. And it says, he chose you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And what did you, you choose me for? I choose you and appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that will change the world, fruit that will allow people to go to heaven. Whoa, you chose me for that? Then it says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're my witness. So if you're a follower of Christ, you're a witness. <laughs> you that's not, that's already done. The only question is, what kind of witness are you? What a responsibility. God depends on us. And then uh, God's called, uh, you're called to do something great. It says, Ephesians 2.10, you're God's workmanship. You were created for this. And no matter what has happened in your past, God can use for good. And no eye has seen, no ears heard what God wants to do through people. So God loves you, he chose you, the spirit is in you. And you were called to do something great. And so I challenge you, let's do that. Let's make something happen. Let's do something great. <laughs> I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to be transparent about our church family. God's just, we've been so blessed in this church that God continually moves. And we've been blessed to, to have slow, steady growth, really, always, because God's awesome. And we're trying to be faithful. And um, so uh, we had a little uh, staff meeting. And it dawned on me after Christmas, I was concerned. After Christmas Eve, where we had record numbers, but I'm like, I don't know if we're if we have the proper infrastructure for God to do more here. 
And I've always taught our staff that, that this, ever since this church was 70 people, I'm like, hey, we need to be prepared for God to double our ministry. So if it's 70 people for 140, and, so, and, and that's what, you know, you need to be, you need, we need to be prepared for God to move in this church to bring people here, and, and they grow. So in staff, I said, guys, I, I love you, but I got to crack the whip a little bit. We got, we got some stuff we got to get done. I want to share with you because we're the same church. The first thing I said is, guys, we got to have quality control. We got to have excellence everywhere. And I said to the staff, and I'm saying, if you see anything that's not excellent here, we need your help. Help fix it. <laughs> Don't just call 1-800-MAKE-A-REPORT. Don't do that. Help fix it. That's what followers do. If you think hospitality's off, doggone it, they need me. I'm signing up for hospitality. If you think something needs, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to help. I'm cause, Because who is the church? You are, right? That's what the Bible says. You're the church. Church isn't a building. You're the church. All right? Second thing I said was, um, look, for now on, guys, listen. Here's what it means to follow Christ. We don't wait for people to come to us. We go to people. And we always, every, all of you, I challenge you, every time you come here, look for people to go and bless and say, good morning, how are you, I love you, are you plugged in, are you new here? You, you know, own that, you do that. You don't know what people are going through, but just look for opportunities to love on people. Come here to put something into it, not just get something out of it. Number three, I said to the staff, I said, look, here's what I expect out of anyone here, and I, I asked this from you, I said, uh, you know your whole job description, the piece of paper? I'm like, that's only about half of what we expect from you, that job description. All right? I said, what I expect from all of you is to make something happen. I want you to make something spiritual happen. And that's what God wants for all of us, to make something happen with our lives. All right? So how do we do this? How does this work? It's, I love 2 Corinthians 5. It says, here's how it works. You need to understand this. Here's how I work in your life. It's so powerful. It says, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, that's anyone, then here's how this works. The old is gone, and you're a whole new creature. You're not a better version of your old self. You're a whole new self. Wow, that, that's refreshing. Then it says, God gave us the ministry. You have a ministry. God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Please pay attention to what God's trying to tell us in the scripture. And then it says, he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. All of us, all of his followers. All right? And it says, we are therefore, now get this, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We're Christ's ambassadors. Think about that. That is a big deal. Do you know what an ambassador is? You know, we're the United States. God's blessed us. We're top dog country. And for all the other countries, we have ambassadors that represent our country. And you're God's ambassador. Look at, uh, or let me share this. An ambassador is an accredited diplomat sent by a country as an official representative. You are God's official representative. You are his accredited ambassador. Man, what if we all lived our lives that way? But we're called to. That's who we are. God makes it pretty clear. I've never shared this before, um, but uh, I'm going to share this with you. Um, my cousin, growing up, I saw my cousin a couple times a year. I have a very small family. I hardly ever see him anymore. But my cousin lives in, in Vermont. And she got remarried, and I had never met her, her new husband but I always, it was weird, I always heard he was kind of a big deal. And I always heard that he was a lawyer, and, but it was like, hush, hush. It was like, what does he do? Everything was like, hush, hush. Part of me was like, maybe he's a spy. Do you ever think this about people? I'm very weird. I think this about people. I've thought about some of you. Like, maybe you're spies. And don't ever watch the TV show The Americans. It will screw you up forever. You will think your neighbors are spies and stuff. It's just weird. Maybe he's a spy. So we don't, we don't meet that often, but um, unfortunately it was a funeral. And so the first time I met him, it was time sitting at a table having refreshments, you know. And I, I, I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to get into this top secret stuff. So 
what do, what do you, I knew as a lawyer, what do you do? Come to find out, he was an ambassador to Germany. The first service didn't do that. Good for you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. I had to walk first service through it. I'm like, somebody should have said woo there, and then I did it again, but not second service. Thank you. Yes, you are on it. So, uh, so this was during the George Bush administration, right? And so he still works in the. And so he said, um, and I, I'm like, wait a minute, George Bush, he was like fly below the radar, but he was a Christian, very serious to him, his faith. As a matter of fact, he had a drinking problem, and he quit drinking, became a Christian. And so I'm like, is he, is he like the real deal? He's, he's like, you have no idea. He really lives his faith, but in a super humble way. And he says, as a matter of fact, you're a pastor, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, um, he goes, he loves to encourage people. This is one of the things he does with his life now. He said, would you mind if I let him know about you and he sent you a signed picture and some encouragement? I'm like, that's weird. You don't need to. He's like, no, he would be blessed. So I'm like, okay, huh, cool. So this guy is an ambassador, an ambassador to Germany. And guess what? I totally made that story up just now. Did I get you? I got the, I got, got you. And I had a lot of fun doing that. I totally made that story up. But it reminds you what a big stinking deal an ambassador is, right? Like, whoa! What I'm not making up straight out of God's word is, if you're in Christ, you're a whole new creature, and you are God's ambassador. Thank you. This should change your life. He depends on you. Man, this is, this, is, this is a game changer. And so we need to understand this. And, 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 and God's power is inside of you. None of this is on your own power anymore. And, and God will even give you the words to say the Bible says. He's just looking for someone that's available and says, use me, God. And all of us should say, here I am, uh, send me. So point number three is this. Uh, God wants to do something in you and through you right where you're at. Right where you're at. Sometimes we're like, yeah, I'll let God use me when I get promoted or this season of life. Or Nope, that's not the way God works. God wants to do something in you and through you right where you're at. Colossians says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do, it, do everything. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to share a story with you I call the Will Muff story, all right? Um, when I was a, a, a Christian, a new a Christian, and... After a while, God called me, and it's really weird for me. I, it was such a clear calling. Like, I have to do this to be faithful to God. I have to become a pastor. I know, but I just knew. It's just so did my wife. It's like, I know. It's scary. It's crazy. But you, you have to do this. And no one was taking me serious. But I had to answer this call, whatever it meant. And um, so the church I was at and my mentor was hiring someone to work at the church. So I'm like, well, that's perfect. It's my mentor, hire me, I'll get my foot in the door in the church, and this will be the path for me to become a pastor. So this is great, and surely, since he's my mentor, I'll, I'll get the job. So I applied for the job with my mentor, and I, I, probably, I probably assumed I had the job. And I called to check, looking forward to it, and found out I didn't get the job. That hurts, right? That brings stuff out in you. It's normal. And then I found out who did get the job. And it's a guy named Will Muff. And so I didn't like Will Muff. Are you with me, church? But Will Muff got the job. I'm like, oh, you know, they made a mistake. So a year or two later, whatever, um, God parts the seas, and I get to go to this little dying church in Medway, 70 people, and, and God began to move over there, and and in and, and and the first year or two, we're, we're having some slow growth. We're getting over 100 people, over 150 people. And sometime there in the first few years, one Sunday morning, Will Muff comes to our church. Yeah, is he even welcome, you know? <laughs> is he even welcome? I'm joking about that part. But inside, there's that fleshly part, like, 
whatever. So Will Muff comes with his wife, and they came back. They decided to make our church their church. And they became leaders, and it was always a little weird for me because Will Muff got the job. That was a mistake. <laughs> so this really happened. God, this, I, I so remember this so vividly. I'm not making this story up, church, all right? Uh, th- this is so vivid. Um, one Sunday morning, right, out, right outside the old church, and I remember where I rested my arm, and Will Muff said, can I talk to you for a minute, Mike? And I'm like, sure, Will Muff. I'd just soon have a distant relationship. He goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, do you, um, do you remember several years ago when um, I got that job and you didn't? <laughs> I'm like, remember? I've been ticked about it ever since, bro. I can't believe you're bringing this up. I've been all honked off about it. Every time I look at you, I remember that job. And he goes, and sometimes God really speaks through people. Sometimes God will speak through you. He goes, Mike, don't you get it? And I'm like, get what? And he goes, don't you get it? You're my pastor now. Look at what God's doing through you. And if you'd have got that job, maybe all of this wouldn't have happened. And it was like, whoa. And, and I looked at my life, and God kept me in this office in engineering where no one was a Christian, and God called me to grow there, and it helped prepare me for ministry. And it was like, oh, my gosh. And the thing is, is every one of us, God wants to use us right where we're at. Wherever you're at, you're there for a reason. You're God's ambassador. And we need to remember that. We need to trust God in that, okay? So important. Point number four, God wants to promote you. All right, we're all promoted, but uh, you gotta, you need to stretch yourself. You need to get uncomfortable. This is how God works. The Bible says, Jesus said to his disciples, if, if you want to be my disciple, if you really want to follow me, this is Jesus piped right to you, here's what you do. You must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Now, this was written when crosses we're, we're, we're all over Israel as torture devices. And if you got on one, you were going to die. And it's like, you're going to have to die to yourself if you're going to follow me. Man, they certainly understood that. Here's, here's the deal. God is not going to promote you ever. God is not going to do what he wants to do through you. He's not going to do great things through you if you don't take crazy steps of faith and continue to grow. What following Christ is all about is taking uncomfortable steps of faith and letting God show up. And uncomfortable steps of faith and letting God, that's what it's all about. So I came to church for the wrong reasons to have God do a miracle and save our marriage because my wife was going to divorce me. And we came back, and, and then I'm like, I want to do this. I want to learn how to follow. I want to grow. I want to be a Christian. I want to because this was awesome and make a difference in my life and in my family. And everyone I knew that was the real deal was in one of these things called small groups. Now, that stinks for me because I am very uncomfortable going to people's houses, very uncomfortable. Frankly, I'm very uncomfortable having people come to my house. And it's just true. I'm, I'm socially weird a little bit. And it's, it's just, it's just it's so uncomfortable. So to go hang out with Christians with my issues of recovery and guilt and shame and learn about the Bible, that is, that is so uncomfortable to me. But, but if you're going to be the real deal, you got to take crazy. And that became the, one of the most important things in the world to me, being in a small group. There's no way I'd be here if I wasn't always a part of a small group ministry. And that's essential to us being all God wants, taking that crazy step of faith. <laughs> the idea of tithing, oh, my gosh. We came to church, and my wife would put five bucks in the offering, and it bothered me. And then God saved our marriage, and we'd been there a year or two, and God's moving in our lot, making our, us better parents. He's moving in our kids' lives. And my wife started putting 20 bucks in. 
And I'm seeing this. I'm like, I'm going to talk to her on the way home, man. She needs to do some math. That's some jack. And then this idea of tithing, that's crazy. It is. It's a crazy step of faith. But I saw that everyone's a real deal. So I'm like, I'm going to take a crazy step of faith. There's no way I'd be where I was at if I didn't take crazy steps of faith. You know? Um, public speaking. This is so the truth. All right? Um, when, 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 when you're in recovery and, and when you're on drugs and stuff, you, you're, you can lose your mind. And it takes like months to get any part of you back. So when I would go in recovery, then the first couple months, and one of the things they do is they have these things they read, and they want to get you involved. So they pass, and they say, "Will you read, buddy?" And I would sit there and just shit. Please don't ask me to read because I like can't. I didn't have my mind back yet. I like couldn't read. I was terrified just to read off a piece of paper. And now God uses me to communicate. Because you'll never know until you begin to take these crazy steps of faith. That's what following Christ is. Taking the next crazy step and the next crazy. And we're never done. So if you're around here and you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s, we're never done. Taking crazy steps of faith saying, God, how can I do more for you? How can I glorify you? That's what followers do. So where's God calling you to take a crazy step of faith? Great story in the Bible. Uh, check this out. This is when um, um, the 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 is- Israelites what they were they were the, God wanted to take them into the Promised Land, but they've been wandering around in the desert for forty years. So this is Joshua's job. So we pick up here, and here's what Joshua said: um, told the people, "Consecrate yourselves, because tomorrow's the day. God's going to do amazing things." And here's what it says: So the Lord said to Joshua, "Today." I'm going to begin to exalt you in the eyes of Israel. And they're going to know that I'm with you, that God is with you. Tell the priest, they're carrying around the Ark of the Covenant. So tell the priest that um, when you reach the edge of the Jordan River, all right, just you got to go stand in the river, and that's when God's going to move. When you reach the edge of the river, you got to put your foot in the river. And that's when God's going to move. And it says God's going to, like, part the seas. Now, can you imagine the faith that would take now? Here's the part that I love that I never saw before. And I, I just imagined if I was with them, I would have been that guy. It says in the Bible, but make sure you understand this, the Jordan is at flood stage. And I'd have been like, are you a, you're not listening to God. The river's flooded. Surely if you were going to do this, you'd pick the right season. The river's flooded, ding dong. Who's going to put their foot in the flooded river? This is ridiculous. That's how I would have handled it. And it says the Bible, as soon as the priest carried the ark and reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water, the water just, 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 just piled up and they entered into the promised land. You got to take the first crazy step in order for God to part the seas. This is always the way God works. You take a step, God works. You take a step, God works. So the Bible says, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. And what do you do? Always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope you have. Always be prepared to share him. This is point number six. You have a platform and you have responsibility. You have a bigger platform than you will ever know. But you have to take steps of faith and share him and trust God to do the rest. But you have a platform. If you're with your kid in your car, that's a platform to tell them about the love of God. If you're at your dinner table, that's a platform. But if you're in line at Walmart, that's a platform. If you go to work, that's a platform. If you're on the phone with someone, that's a platform. We all have a platform. Social media is a platform. Now, I love some of you. Well, I love all of you. Sorry. I think you'll know why I say that in a second. And I don't mean this towards anybody, but it drives me crazy to see followers of Christ on social media not glorify God, but show me their steak they ate last night. And I'm like, I don't really care about your steak. And then they don't glorify God. 
and they show me 150 pictures of their condominium in Florida. And I'm like, I don't really care about your condominium. And there's a little part of me that's like, why don't you cover up? You don't have a 20-year-old's body anymore, man. What are you doing? And you see people do all this crazy stuff on one of the biggest platforms in the world that we could glorify God with. And I see heroes that do the opposite. They're like, I check into church every week. God's making a difference in my life. You should check out church. You should do this. God's in, I'm like, look at that witness. What if we all used our platforms uh, for what God would want? The Bible says don't conform to the patterns of this world. We are supposed to be different. We're ambassadors for Christ. So, so what do we do? It says always be prepared. Here's what you got to do. You got to write your story. You got to have a story. You got to know your story. And this is what five minute assignment that will change your life. I want you to write down your story this week. Today would be the appropriate day. Just write it down on paper. Write it down on your computer. Write it down on your cell phone. Less than three minute story. And the first thing I want you to do, as soon as you've written that down, print it off. And put it in your Bible. You put your story in your Bible. Do you know why? I bet you don't. I don't know if you know what I'm going to say. Because someday you're going to be in heaven. And your kids are going to clean out your house. And one of the wildest moments they're going to have is when they find your Bible. And they will go through your Bible. And when they read that, your story about the difference that God made in your life. It'll change your legacy forever. I challenge you to do this. Do it today. Put your story in your Bible. I also encourage you, if you want, send your story into the church. There's information about this in the outline. I think it's my story at medwaychurch.org. And here's, what, here's, what I, here's why. One, it will bless me. When I'm discouraged, I'm going to go read them stories. I'm going to be like, everything else is a lie from the devil. God's moving. But the other thing I'm going to do and I, I, I promise you, I will, do, I will read every story, but I will pray over every story. And I will pray, God, may you use this story for your glory. I will pray for God to work through you and your story. Every one of them, I promise. All right? And then I want you to pray for opportunities to share your story. And live your lives that way. And you wouldn't believe the difference it will make. you gotta, you got to get vulnerable. you got to get real. People don't do this. It was so weird in my small group last week. I said, let's go around and share our stories. And they, they, only, they only do the they do the little pretty stuff. I'm like, that's not your story. So we're going around there. Here's the pretty stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Weren't you locked up in, like, prison? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, that's your story. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't your husband die of cancer? Yep. That's your story. Didn't you have that suicide in your family that you made it through? That's your story. Don't, aren't you wrestling with a kid with mental illness? That's your story, you see? You have a kid that's special needs and you're living this, this incredible life. That's a story. Get real, man. Tell your story for his glory. Always be prepared. Because God's counting on you. So I'm going to end with this. We're going to have a great song. Please live this. Please do this. Write your story, all right? It'll change you. It'll help you. And pray for opportunities to use it. And they'll be everywhere. Begin to live your life this way. Be honest with me, church. How many of you have an iPhone and talk to Siri? Have Siri have her help you? For, eh, oh, it's a little more. 20, 20, 20%, 25%. My kids do this. I don't think of it enough, but my kids, they kind of live by, hey, Siri, do this. Hey, Siri, do that. All right, how many of you have Alexa at your house in any capacity and use Alexa? It's a little more. So we had one, so I had a big idea. I'm going to hook Alexa up in our bathroom. What? Is that weird? That's not creeper. No, and then I'm going to have her set me up with Christian worship music in the morning. It'll be awesome. If I'm shaving or taking, I can have, that'll just start my day off awesome. And all I got to do is tell her, put that, and I got it hooked up, and my wife was in the other room, and first I'm talking to it, and it's lighting up, and it's not talking, I'm like, um, hey, Siri. And Siri says, 
I will not respond to that because it was Alexa. I was having an affair with Alexa, with Siri, getting them mixed up, getting my girls mixed up. You know what I'm saying? You call her the right name, and it's like, hey, Alexa, play Spotify top 10 Christian. And she does. And my wife's like, look at Mike. Woo! Christian music in the background. And then I'm, I'm getting, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, hey, tell me the weather, Alexa. And she tells me the weather. So I'm rolling out, so I got one. I'm like, this will be incredible. I'm like, hey, Alexa, will you pray with me this morning? She didn't do it. No matter how much technology is here, Alexa's not going to tell the world about Jesus. God chose you and I to do that. Alexa's not going to tell the world about Jesus. God chose us to do that. Why do we care? Because if he's blessed you, the greatest thing we can do is give that away. That's why. That's it. There's nothing greater you can do with your life than share that. That's why we care. I want to ask if you'd stand, and, and I want to pray with you. We're going to worship God. Bow your heads. Father God, uh, may we understand that you depend on us. And may we say, here I am, send me. And we actually look for opportunities to go because you've called us and chosen us. And we are your ambassadors. And may we store up as much fruit as possible. From this day forward, God, we got, we're going to go. We're going to go for your glory because you've called us and you've chosen us.